I lived in suburban Tokyo for a while. It was a quiet little place with quiet little people and quiet little rumors that seemed to spread like wildfire. Of unfaithful spouses and noisy neighbors, the place only ever seemed lively whenever something scandalous happened, which would be the topic of conversation for the week before another rumor would inevitably come around. Our family was subject to this treatment the day we moved in from the countryside. Whenever they were around us, they would shake our hands and congratulate us. But the moment they thought we were out of earshot, words such as bumpkin and yoko would find their way to us in hushed whispers. Regardless, we found a way to pay rent for our overpriced one bedroom flat and even to fund me to go to a prestigious private school. There was nothing more important than my well-being and education. My parents worked hard to ensure that I did not go hungry or wanting, while they were pushed to the extremes, often finding them passed out on the couch before their next 12-hour shift. I thought it was all unfair, but more often than not, they would simply reply with nothing but scorn, saying that working hard was part of the process, something that I took to heart for the rest of my life. School was nothing but torture. From the moment I stepped foot, I knew that I was different. Like the neighborhood, it was nothing but murmurs. I sat alone in every class, and the library became my second home, endorsed in reading or studying for the next exam, while everyone sat in their groups, throwing quick glances my way, whispering and then laughing aloud. The second month was worse. They took any opportunity to make my life a living hell, wrecking my desk, breaking my locker, while any attempt to appeal to a teacher was met by nothing but stony silence. A curse of some sorts had come over me. Once, another boy decided to talk to me, which lasted for a grand total of a minute before he became self-conscious of all the judgment. I became the outcast, the excommunicated one, I realized then that I was truly alone and that for at least a few years I'd have to endure. My parents' words never left me and I racked up A's on my tests as terms went by. I had to move away from the library eventually. There were too many people, too many chances to make fun of me. I locked myself up in the school toilets instead where I found a little more peace, paging through books and notes until break was over. And it was in those toilets on that fateful day that I met her. I was quite tense. For some reason, I felt as if something was watching me. I struggled to focus, numbers and letters becoming all but nonsense to me. Within a few minutes, I was already drowsy, my mouth dry. Opening the stall, I looked left and right, saw no one and walked to the basin where I splashed my face with water. I looked in the mirror for a while. I thought things that I thought I would never have to contemplate about how my parents' lives would be so much easier if I disappeared. I retreated back into the stall and felt the tears flowing freely. Suddenly, I felt a hand upon my shoulder and I feared the worst that there was some other kid who found me crying that the bullying would intensify, only it was even worse. I looked up to see a girl in a white shroud, bloody handprints across the dress, lank black hair, so long it tickled my cheeks. I could only stammer, frozen, unwilling to move. Her hand gripped harder, to the point at which my shoulder began to ache, but I was too scared to move. She spoke in an ethereal voice, that seemed halfway between reality and a dream. Her words didn't seem material. Tell me why you are here? I didn't reply. Why are you crying? You are sad? I nodded, fixing my gaze on the stall door behind her, calculating, reading if I could escape. I can make all your problems disappear. No, you can't. No, this isn't real. This is all just a dream. Go away, demon! Stay back! <laughs> I kept yelling and screaming, and then shut my eyes tight, 
tears threatening to drop. Looking back up, there was nothing. The silence was deafening. I picked up my bag and looked around the room. Make my problems go away, please. The day went by. I dragged myself home, opening the door to an empty house. My parents wouldn't be back until morning. Like clockwork, I made myself dinner, studied, and went to bed again. It was all routine. Outside, the wind howled a little louder. The next day, I noticed something. The usual kids who bullied me were nowhere to be seen. The day went a little smoother than usual. Not being paranoid of beating around every corner did that to you. I went home, made myself dinner, studied, and went to bed again. Again, the same. The next day, as the homeroom teacher read out names, half the class seemed gone. In the middle of maths, a worried parent came barging into the room, beckoning for the teacher. There were words of anger outside. I went home, made myself dinner, studied, and went to bed again. The third day, an assembly was called. Students had gone missing all in one night. We were to be escorted to school until further notice. Of course, I had no one to escort me, but I'd be fine. Rumours circulated, rumours again, rumours that I was responsible for the students going missing. However, that wasn't the case, as rumours aren't always true. But I knew who was responsible, and she kept me company. I see her always, dancing across the floor in the blood-stained dress that sways in the wind. Ha 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 ha!